We're in a brand new series, kick off the start of 2017. 2017, doesn't it sound so futuristic? I mean, I remember watching movies when I was a kid, and there'd be like the year 2012, 2020. You know, those are things that I thought was like, man, that's way off. We're almost at 2020. 2017, it sounds so futuristic. I'm not used to it yet. I'm still writing checks at 2016 on my checks. I'm sure all the institutions love the fact that I'm signing it January 4th, 2016. I'm not ready for 2017 yet. But what better way to kick off a new year than just do it with a hashtag fresh start. That's where we're at in our first fresh series, fresh starts. Um, I want to look at this morning a man who was given a fresh start, a new beginning, when the opportunity was presented for him to follow Jesus. Now, it's not something that he had to do. He wasn't coerced or forced or they didn't twist his arm. He had the opportunity with the simple command to follow Jesus. And it's not that it was just as simple as get up and, and, and leave and go with him. It was actually a calling to have his life radically changed, where everything he knew would change the moment he decided that he would follow Jesus. If you have your Bibles, we'll be in the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 9, starting in verse 9. Um, I'm actually going to be looking at the story through the lens of um, two other Gospel writers, Mark and Luke, but you can stay anchored to Matthew 9. I'm not going to be jumping around on you. I want you to have a central text that you focus on as we go through it. Matthew 9 verse 9. Now, as you're turning there, you have to admit the name Matthew is the second best male name in the entire Bible, <laughs> right after the name of Jesus. Matthew is a pretty good name. I might be a little biased, but I've never had to worry about people struggling to pronounce my name or asking me, what in the world were your parents thinking of when they named you Matthew. In fact, Matthew is such a strong name, I think it goes with just about any last name that you could ever put to it. Because nothing rhymes with it to make it like really weird. Um, like I went to school with a Lauren Warren. That was kind of strange to me. I also went to school with a Rusty Keys. I don't know. I was questioning how much his parents actually truly loved him. Rusty Keys. I don't know why I mentioned that. Anyway... Matthew, the soon to become disciple of Jesus, might have had a very strong name, but he had a profession that even a strong name could say. What did Matthew do for a living? Does anybody know what he what he was? Tax collector. He was a tax collector. A tax collector. That's right. And the in, in um, the tax system worked like this: you get taxed. Uh, on your way to work, you get taxed when you got to work, you get taxed when you got home from work. No, wait, that's our system today. <laughs> um, their tax system was a little bit different. A, a tax collector, in fact, we don't really even have those in how our system works. A tax collector collected duties on imported goods by farmers, merchants, uh, and caravans. I've never seen a caravan in my life. But under the Roman Empire system, Matthew, what he would do is he would pay all of those taxes in advance for those people. So at first it might sound like, wow, that's really great. What a great guy. What a convenient service. Uh, but this isn't like an ATM where there's small service fees, small service charges may apply. This is uh, a guy who all tax collectors were the same in the fact that they are notoriously corrupt. They would ex uh, extort far and above what was owed to ensure that they became very wealthy. Now, um, this guy is out for himself only. And who are you going to complain about this guy raising your taxes so much? If you went and you complained to the Romans, they actually backed whatever taxation decision that he made. So you either have a hefty tax, or you have a hefty tax with a hefty beatdown followed by some time in a Roman jail where you have no rights because you're not a Roman citizen. So those are the options. You want to pay the hefty tax or you want a hefty tax and a hefty beat down? I think I'll go with the hefty tax. Yay! <laughs> Who's excited to see Matthew, the tax collector, set up in his, his tax tent? Anybody excited to see this guy? 
No, I didn't think so. So we first meet Matthew in Matthew 9. He's writing his story, and it's probably the world's shortest autobiography that's ever written. The thing that I like about Matthew's story, though, is that your story that you share about how Jesus changed your life it should be short and concise and to the point. Matthew's right here. He's only a few verses about how God changed his life forever and, and how his testimony becomes the very instrument that will lead others to meeting Jesus. It's not about uh, long being long-winded. It's about being concise. This is what Jesus did in my life. So Matthew 9.9 9 says, As Jesus went on from there, he saw a, ma a man named Matthew sitting at the tax collector's booth. We know as we study other texts that Matthew's in fact in Capernaum. It's his tax booth that's set up right on the main highway that led into town. And Jesus, when he encounters Matthew, he only needed to speak two words in the Greek to forever change Matthew or Levi's life. And that is, follow me. Follow me. Uh, Ake luthie, luthieo ago. It means join me. Become a disciple of mine. 92 times in scripture, ake luthieo, ake luthieo ago is used. And Jesus would use it not to just individuals. Sometimes he would use it to a crowd of people. Follow me. Become my disciple. And it's what the Holy Spirit has prompted in the hearts and lives of believers, is to follow Jesus. What a grand adventure it is to follow Jesus. Am I right? We aren't haphazardly going through life. There is a divine purpose as we are led by the Spirit to follow the very Son of God. Akalutheo, ago, follow me. Now, the stunning, stunning thing about this text, as you follow it, it's not that Jesus extends an invitation for someone to become his disciple. In fact, that's what rabbis did. In fact, if you think about it today, uh, what is the one thing that a teacher needs? Students, right? You can't be a teacher unless you've got students. Just like a rabbi needed disciples. And so it's very common for a rabbi, I'm not just talking about Jesus, rabbi meant teacher, for a rabbi to see potential in somebody and at the right time to extend an invitation to, hey, I got something that I can teach you. Do you want to learn from me? Do you want to be my disciple? So it's not strange that Jesus says, follow me, akelutheo, ago, to, to somebody. But what is strange is, the actual individual that he extends the opportunity to. You see, Matthew is a Jew, but he's hated by other Jews. He's a traitor. He's a Roman sellout. And you're asking him to follow you? In fact, tax collectors, I love this, as you study out that word tax collector, there's another word that usually follows tax collectors. Does anybody know what that word may be? Sinners. Tax collectors and sinners. They're almost used synonymously. Like the worst type of people on this planet. Tax collector. I was going to go there with a profession that we, we also think of, but I don't want to do that because there's some great people in that profession. But that type of profession, we tend to think certain things about them. And so this is the same way. Tax collectors. Oh, the worst. Those are just sinners. They just, they, they, they take from us, they steal from us, they rob. They, the call to have Matthew become your disciple would be on par for Michigan or Michigan State to go, you know, I don't like, I don't like either one of our coaches at all. I don't like them at all. So what we're going to do as the athletic directors, we're going to fire them and we're going to introduce this guy as the new head coach of Michigan or Michigan State. Now, if you're a college football fan in general, you don't have to even be from our state. This guy gives you some reaction, right? You know, anyone know who that is? Jim, Jim Russell. Yes, that's right. That's right. And so they're like, what? You want Matthew to follow you? You want Jim Trestle to be your, 
You're a football coach. It's like on par with that. But Matthew is the perfect choice to show that no one is disqualified from receiving God's grace, no matter what has transpired in their past. Follow me. It's an invitation in your present, and it leads to what God has prepared to you in the future, and it has nothing to do with your past. That's what's glorious about the gospel. Your past doesn't disqualify you from it. I mentioned the name Matthew is a fantastic name, but I didn't really tell you why it is so fantastic. The name Matthew in the Hebrew means... Well, let's, let's hold that thought for a little bit. I like sus suspense. I like to keep, keep you guessing and wondering and waiting on the edge of your seats. <laughs> why is it so wonderful? Tell us. Let's continue where we left off, and I will tell you at some point in this message why the, word, why the name Matthew is just fantastic. Jesus says, follow me. And Matthew got up, and he quite literally follows Jesus. Now you might be surprised to learn that Matthew's story of himself, his autobiography, doesn't in fact give you the best description of his calling, of, of his conversion story. But that's actually, I started to think about this a little bit. Um, what name, first of all, what name does Matthew call himself in Matthew 9? It's not a trick question. What does he refer to himself as? No, not <laughs> he, he calls himself Matthew, right? Isn't that what your text says, Matthew? I'm pretty sure, right? Does it say Matthew? Yes, it does. Okay. He refers to himself as Matthew. However... That's not the name that he went by. In fact, if you were like, man, you got to avoid Matthew's tax tent. People would have been like, what? Who? Who? There's another tax guy out there? That's not the name he went by. Uh, it's a little strange that Matthew refers to himself as Matthew because that's not, in fact, his name. The reason I believe that he writes himself as Matthew is because... When Jesus forever changes your life, like when you look back on your life and you reflect on that time before Christ, you're able to do it through the lens that I am a new creation. He still sees himself as Matthew, even though he's reflecting back on his past before the calling came to follow Jesus. So Matthew's telling of his conversion experience isn't the best one. And, and this is what I thought of. I thought, you know what? How many people like autobiographies in here? How many like to read them? I think they're fascinating. I think they're very interesting. Um, but you want to know the truth about autobiographies? There's a lot of chapters that are left out of those autobiographies, and they're done so on purpose. Nobody's like, oh, remember that one moment that was so super embarrassing? Like, I want to include that in my chapter. I want to highlight that. I want to spend, like, three chapters, like, really bringing that out. That awkward teenage phase of my life where I lived on Clearasil and, like, pizza and it was playing video games till 2 in the morning. Like, that's great stuff. Let's put that in the autobiography. If you really want to know someone's autobiography, the best thing you can do is what? Ask their closest friends. <laughs> Especially when they're telling you a story like, hey, did that really go down like that? Like your friends know. Like there's, there's, there's truth in what happened and then there's like real solid truth. Like there's parts that you kind of left out a little bit. So I, I got together with a couple of Matt's closest friends, uh, Mark and Luke, and I asked them to spill the beans on what was really going down. They're like, let me tell you about this tax collector friend of mine, because you read his autobiography, and there's some, something that's missing a little bit. So I want to go to some good friends, Luke and Mark, for a moment. So Mark says something a little bit different than what Matthew says. I can't look at Jim Trestle picture anymore. He's throwing me off. Oh, let me go over here. All right. Whew, the spirit of Jim Trestle. You've got to change that. So Mark says in, in, in his gospel, in chapter 2, verse 13, you can write that down as a reference point. You don't have to flip there. It says, once again, Jesus went out beside the sea, and all the people came to him, and he taught them there. That's great. So we know it's Capernaum. 
where he's at and track it. In verse 14, as he's walking along, he saw Levi, son of Alphaeus, sitting at the tax booth. Follow me, he told them. And Levi got up and followed him. So who's at the tax booth? Levi. Well, how about Luke? How about Luke? So it's tied one to one. We got Matthew saying it's Matthew, and we got Mark saying it's, it's Levi. Luke never misses a moment. In fact, this guy is a physician. He's skilled at like noticing things and taking detailed reports down. This guy has so much, he's, he's wealthy, he's the most wealthy of the 12. And so when he got paid a lot of money, you know the name of the tax guy, right? In fact, he's got patients that are coming in to see Luke, and Luke, they're like, man, it was a close one. I was in, I was in Capernaum, and that, that Levi guy, he was, he was out there early. I, I had on this like wig, and I was able to like skate by him. He didn't realize that it was me in the caravan with all my goods. So you think that if anybody knows the correct name, it would be Luke. But before I share what Luke writes, avoiding Luke's, or not Luke's, avoiding Levi's tent reminds me of a story uh, in my life of something that happened. Uh, it reminds me of trying to avoid Levi's tax tent. Anyone here ever been to the Shiawassee County Fair before? Shiawassee County Fair? So I could say anything about it. You guys have no clue. <coughs> they got bear wrestling. <laughs> they got some wild stuff at that Shiawassee County Fair. Let me tell you. Uh, no, it's a nice fair. And so whatever I say, don't avoid Shiawassee County Fair. That's not the point of the story. Uh, my first time ever going to Shiawassee County Fair, uh, I found myself at the back of, 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 the, of the fair into a tent that was a pretty much deserted tent. Um, here is a life lesson that I have learned. If all the other tents are full of people, but there's one that is not, avoid the empty tent. Does anyone know what I'm, what I'm, where I'm getting at with this? There's a reason why the crowds of people are not going into the one tent. Okay, so I walk into this tent, I'm like, wow, where is everybody? No one's here. And what I found is I had people flock upon me, pressure me, as I found that I had entered, in fact, entered the volunteer sign-up tent. <laughs> Do you want to become a fire, a, a, a volunteer firefighter? I, I, that's a big decision. I don't know. I wasn't ready for that when I walked in the tent. Would you like to adopt a pet right now? I don't know. I was looking for elephant ears. You got elephant ears. Anybody? So I couldn't get out of there fast enough. And that's what I, when I thought about Levi's tent, it was like the Shiawassee County Fair tent all over again. It's like, whoa, gotta get away from that. So here's Luke's version, Luke 5, 27. Jesus went out and he saw a tax collector by the name of Levi sitting at the tax booth. Follow me, Jesus said to him. And Levi got up. Luke gives a detail here that's awesome. He says he left everything. He left everything. And he followed him. I think that left everything portion is often overlooked. It says, Then Levi had a great banquet for Jesus at his house, and a large crowd of tax collectors and others were eating with them. So when you study out Luke's account, the first thing Levi does is he throws a party. He gets the invitation to follow Jesus, and then he celebrates. And I love that because this is a going away forever party. I am leaving everything. Everything I worked so hard to get is gone. It's done with. I have a new purpose. And it doesn't involve my old way of living anymore. That's so true with all of us. I'm not talking about profession. But what I'm talking about is that God would rewire or hardwire, God would hardwire a new heart with a new desire inside of us. Matthew used to seek after certain things. He would seek after wealth, money, and possessions. Luke says that guy that you know about that would seek after getting wealthy at the expense of others, 
He left it all behind. At the command to follow Jesus, the greediest of them all, the greediest guy, is going to become the most generous. That is like, I went back and I was able to find a picture of Matthew in the gospel because they had Polaroids back then. And this is Matthew. Does anybody know what this is from? Scrooge. Scrooge. Christmas Carol, 1951 for you. I didn't go with the, the newer version. This is the real version right here. And so this is on par. What Luke's writing is like on par with when Scrooge starts like opening that window. And he's like, hey, boy, go buy a ham for people. And, and he's just generous. Isn't that how that goes? Or did they rewrite it? i got to brush up on my 1951 version. But he becomes so super generous. Like people are starving to death. They don't have... Uh, heat for their homes because of this guy. He's getting wealthy up everyone else. That is like Matthew. He has this transformation that he's going, the first thing he does is he's going to throw a party and he's going to invite all of his friends. And so I told you I was going to tell you how awesome the name Matthew is. Are you all ready for that? Mm -hmm. And you're going to change your name after you leave here. We're going to have a name Matthews. Sounds so good. I'm going to change my middle name to Matthew. So before Jesus came into his life, the tax collector was known as Levi. Levi. So Levi, the son of Alphaeus. If you've got your notes, this is really cool. Levi comes from the Hebrew word <laughs> meaning to lend. Okay, now that's exactly what he did. He would, and it also comes from the other root word, which means attached or pledged. So Levi is a pledge attached to the Romans. And he would lend to the Romans his own money. And then he would take from God's people, the Jews, in order to make himself wealthy. But the name of Matt, or Matthew, it comes from the Hebrew word, which means given. And it also means gift of God. And so this is beautiful. Levi used to take from people, but Matthew will give to people what he received, the very gift of God, the grace of God at the command, follow me. And so he's giving people grace. He's giving people the very grace of God, Jesus Christ. And that's what the party's all about. I want other people, my friends... If God's grace could find me, tax collector, a.k.a. sinner, man, I know a bunch of sinners. And I want to gather them all up because it changed my life forever. And I want to see it happen for them, too. And so, Levi, verse 29 of Luke's Gospel held a great banquet for Jesus at his house, and a large crowd of tax collectors and others were eating with them. The Pharisees and the teachers of the law who belonged to their sect complained to his disciples, Why do you eat and drink with tax collectors and sinners? There it is again. Of the four gospel writers, it was Matthew, only Matthew of the four, the least likely choice for Jesus to say, Follow me. He's the only one who presented Jesus to the Jews as their hope for Messiah, tailoring his account to answer their questions. And from that time on, instead of collecting, collecting tax money, Matthew began to collect souls for the kingdom. The feast itself represents Matthew's new calling on his life. It's the same calling we have to invite people to gather together to hear about God's love for them through Jesus Christ. In fact, Matthew would write about Jesus' teaching the parable of the wedding feast in Matthew 22. And he actually flips his personal experience. See, in this story, he's collecting taxes. Jesus says, follow me. And then there's a party afterwards. But in Matthew 22, there's a party where the, the, where the servants are supposed to go out and invite anybody, everybody, to come to this wedding party. It's amazing. And then right after that, what does Matthew do? He starts writing about taxes. I, I love it. I was, I was kind of uh, chuckling at that. It, it's a flip on what happened in his own life. So the Pharisees wanted to know, I'm going to wrap this up, why Jesus would eat with tax collectors and sinners. 
Jesus answers them, it's not the healthy who need a doctor, it's the sick. I've not come to call the righteous, but I've called, come to call sinners to repentance. Case in point, this tax collector right here that you're all looking at that invited you to this party, he's my disciple. really neat thing about Levi's life being completely changed forever. His new life would be nothing like his old life used to be. I can tell you that although I have never served as a tax collector, and I'm confident I never will, <laughs> um, I know my life in Christ is vastly different than what my life would be like apart from him. I've seen people who are born, and by the time they're age four, they already know what they're going to do. In fact, sometimes they even do that very thing that they said that they were going to do. Um, there's an internet video of a five-year-old boy who preaches the gospel. And I'm just blown away because I'm like, wow, you're not going to find a YouTube video of me, homemade video of me preaching the gospel at age five. Like, it, 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 was, it was a process for me to realize God's calling on my life. I'm still amazed 18 years after I preached my first Message, my first sermon, that I am doing this. It, it, it just it, it blows me away. I, I don't know if you understand that or not, because you know me as, as being a pastor. But if you knew me circa 1991, you would go, wow, I, I don't see that. <laughs> I really don't see that. See, there's autobiographies, there's sections that we maybe don't have. i got to believe Matthew's like, wow. This is, this is just so cool. It's incredible the things God has planned for me in Jesus. There's going to be tough moments in Matthew's life. Following Jesus doesn't mean that everything is just like, like roses and everything just is this amazing, I mean, it is amazing, but like easy adventure. I mean, he's not sleeping on Egyptian cotton sheets anymore. He's waking up on the dirt floor going, what city are we in this morning? <coughs> um, it's tough. But every day of following Jesus' lead, there is never a dull moment. I promise you that. He gets to see what happened to him in a tax booth happen to other people in different ways, different times. I want to wrap this up with this. Or maybe not. As a tax collector, Levi would have been good at keeping records and reporting, right? Tax collectors are good at that. There's a natural born gift that Matthew had. It's just that God had a better way that he would use that talent for his glory. So, Matthew would be part of only a third of the entire disciples that would document a gospel of Jesus. There's a subtle message here, and maybe this is just for one person, okay? Maybe it's just for one person in this room. Maybe there is a skill that God has given to you. And it needs to have a little bit of a shift. I'm not saying that what you're doing is wrong. You could be using it in good ways, for good things. But maybe God wants you to look at it through a different lens, shift that skill set just a little bit, and you'll be amazed at what God does through you. Follow me. Ask Him, Lord, help me to use the giftings that you've given me. Because I was born with certain giftings, and when I was spiritually born, you gave me certain, certain giftings. Lord, help me to use those in an even more impactful way to bring people together to meet Jesus. And so, I've used this example again, like knitting. If you're great at knitting, Lord, help me to use my knitting skills to bring people together Maybe we knit together and we talk about Jesus. See, that's what Matthew did. When he followed Jesus, it's not that he wasn't still meticulous and gifted at record keeping. He's just going to use that to document the gospel. So Levi's life before Jesus was so routine. It was get up, pay the Romans, set up tents, Collect from the Jews and get paid. 
That was pretty simple. It's like every day, it's the same thing. There's a predictable flow to his life. But life is different now. And I have been thinking about Matthew all week. And I wonder if the other disciples are not a bit moody when they go to the party. I mean, they're walking in here to Matthew's house and vision this. They go, marble steps? Really? You know, my taxes, my extra taxes, they paid for that. Like, I'm going to chisel the corner on that step because that's what my taxes paid for right there. Six bathrooms? Who needs six bathrooms? I watched that show, House Hunters International. I can't watch that anymore. There's something inside me just like, I like war within myself of like, really, who needs gold countertops in Fiji? Really, come on, people. Use so, many, so much of that money for so much good. And so they walk in here, and they're thinking in their minds, like, this is the last place I ever thought I'd be. Like, I couldn't stand that guy at, at, at the tent, and here I am, I'm at his dinner party. Like, here I am, oops, I'm going the wrong way. Here I am, eating at Jim Trestle's house. Like, no way, I'm wearing my colors. I don't care. I'm wearing them. How do you like this blue and, blue and maize? How do you like it? How do you like my green and white? I'm going to wear it all. I'm going to wear all the Big Ten colors. I'm going to have a Penn State hat on, Michigan shirt, Spartan shoes, Badger side. I don't know. Just I'm going to wear it all. But not Ohio State. And I'm coming to your house, Jim Trestle. That's where I'm coming. And so they're there, and i got to believe they got a little bit of an attitude to them. But I'm not sure if they saw the opportunity that was at hand with all these sinners that would be there, an opportunity to hear about Jesus. But sometime, probably after the party's over, disciples are starting to warm up to Matthew. He really is different. Like, this guy, I've never seen him give anything. He gave me a wet nap at dinner. Like, that was a lot. <laughs> that was pretty cool of him. His ribs were pretty messy. Um, but... He's a routine-oriented, meticulous guy. He's got to be like saying to the other disciples who have been with Jesus longer, so guys, what's the itinerary for tomorrow like? What are we doing? Are we setting up a tent? What are we doing? Come on, guys, what's going on? I'm sure it was Peter's probably the answer. I don't know. We just wake up and we follow Jesus. So, like, when he said follow him, he meant, like, literally, like, we get up, we go where he goes. That's how this thing works. Yes, there's no itinerary in that. But if you follow this out, and this is, this is the end of the chapter, so I have to be done. Verses 35 through 38, it says, Jesus went through all the towns and villages. It's a world tour. Teaching in their synagogues, proclaiming the good news of the kingdom, and healing every disease and sickness. And so what Matthew is learning... Uh, is, yeah, that's right. He's learning how to share the gospel first and foremost. And as you share the gospel, you're able to pray for the sick, lay hands on those that, that are blind and lame, and see miracles take place because you understand what God has provided, what God has done and made available through Jesus. And it also says in that same thing, it says that, Jesus had, saw the crowds, he had compassion on them. It's teaching Matthew to be moved with compassion on people. And then finally, ask the Lord of the harvest, therefore to send out workers into the harvest field. And so the way I wanted to conclude this sermon is to ask you all to pray, asking the Lord of the harvest to send out, the word send out means aka, Balo, akabalo. It's not just this like we have this mission and we got to do it. Like, I can't believe I got to do this. It means to lead somebody forth with a force that they cannot resist. They're so moved with compassion on other people, they just got to bring Jesus to them. Something in me, I just got to share what God has done. And so, um, what this is all about <coughs> is first we learn how to share the gospel. That's why we come here. 
we're moved by compassion on people, that we actually see their needs, and we bring Jesus to meet their needs. And so it says, ask the Lord for more people to do this. And so what I'm asking is that as a church, that we be in prayer, and don't look past yourself, start with yourself, but also think about other people, that God would prepare more people for what he was preparing Matthew for. Knowing what the gospel is all about. Being moved by compassion for other people. And then bringing Jesus to them where they're at. Let's bow our heads and pray.